land acknowledgement. Um, and so we would like to begin by acknowledging with honor and respect the indigenous nations on whose traditional territories the university now stands and whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. We also acknowledge the elders past and present, including MSU's current Council of Elders and humbly ask for their guidance. The Valley of the Flowers has been and remains a place of learning for Native American peoples who for millennia have passed ways of knowing, being, and doing from one generation to the next. While a land acknowledgement is not enough, it is an important social justice and decolonial practice that promotes indigenous visibility and a reminder that we are on settled indigenous land. So we can all keep that in mind. Um, and I would like to introduce um, Admiral David Titley on climate and security risk and um, people, not polar bears. Okay, great. Uh... Okay, so what do you guys, because as I, you probably saw if you just joined here, I do almost everything on Zoom and very little on WebEx. So we have had a few more issues and you would think we would have nine months into doing everything remotely, but here we are. Uh, so what do you guys see? Do you just see me or do you see a slide right now? We can see a slide right now. We can you see can your, see a slide. We can, okay. Looks like we can see your whole computer screen right now. Oh, okay. Well, there's nothing too exciting on it. I can tell you that. Uh, let's see here. So I am going to put this thing into uh, full, whatever they call it, slideshow. Uh, coming, back, coming back to life, hopefully. There we go. That looks almost sort of right. Uh, what I'd like to... Uh, go through today is I'm well let me tell you what I'm not going to do I'm not going to talk about the science of climate change and is climate change real and all that kind of stuff I honest to God hope by 2021 <laughs> uh college educated students that were we're kind of past that by now uh if you got any questions on the science I am happy to answer them I've got three degrees in meteorology uh I've given I forget three or four climate talks at Montana State before, because I like going to Yellowstone. Uh, and I work in Grand Teton Park over the summer. So if you're uh, going down to String Lake, if you guys know where String Lake is in Grand Teton, you'll probably find me because so that's where I work. Uh, but anyways, but I'm gonna talk about really kind of a combination of two things. One, how is uh, the Department of Defense and the Navy, how, I would argue they should be thinking about this, how they used to think about this actually a decade ago until we had the counter-revolution. And of course, this was a verboten topic for a few years. Uh, that is changing quite rapidly right now. Uh, but the other thing I'm gonna talk about is more in general, as you all are starting your careers, just some things that I have found when you're trying to either advocate for a cause or a position, trying to convince somebody why they should care about something that maybe they don't really care about, maybe either because they've got bad information or no information, or they just don't think it's sort of in their job jar. Uh, I'll talk about how back in 2009, when the US Navy started Task Force Climate Change, and I, I was the leader of it, how did I go around the Pentagon and talk to a whole bunch of admirals and generals and very senior civilians about climate and how did we at least for a few years get the navy and the and the u.s department of defense to actually care about this issue as i said until the counter-revolution came through so that those are the two things that i'm gonna try to combine uh for the hosts of this you know whatever format you guys have found work works i'm happy to either talk and then we do q a at the end or if you guys want to uh you know, if somebody, however you do it on the WebEx, if somebody's got a question, if the moderators could let me know, I'm happy to to be interrupted. Honestly, if we don't get through the slides, we don't get through the slides. It's really not that big a deal. Having a conversation is way more important than me going through X number of slides. Okay, and and the good thing is, is I only have a few slides anyway, so so that's uh, that'll help. All right, so. One of the things I found that's useful in communicating 
you know, you can call it the rule of threes, but I think there's been a fair amount of uh, research by psychologists that people are pretty good at remembering three things. Uh, but when you start getting to five, six, seven, eight, it honestly gets really hard and they all start blurring. And I think there's been some research that shows you either remember the first or more usually you remember the last and everything else kind of in the middle goes away. So even though, you know, climate change is, is massively complex, I mean, the the UN IPCC is, is institutionally not capable of writing a report less than 1000 pages. Uh, that doesn't really help when you're trying to convey this to somebody and you know and the first thing you tell somebody is well this is really complicated and has you know massive amounts of nuance you know because what's going to happen <laughs> is whoever your audience is is they're going to go find their phone and they're going to start working emails because it's like okay this is too hard so what i try to do is is get things down to three so like climate change in general I talk about is climate change is it's about people not polar bears but it's about us it's about water uh because if you look at so many of the impacts of climate change it's really water it's either too much or too little it's the wrong place wrong time the water is salty where it used to be fresh wet where it used to be dry liquid where it used to be solid the ocean chemistry itself is changing i mean you guys know out uh you know out in the northern rockies there I mean, snowfall the last two, three decades or so is sort of, you know, up and down, but I'm not sure there's a real trend. But the but the trend that you do see, you see it in the snow tell sites and, and some of the other uh, observations, is the snow it snowpack is melting off faster. So you're getting your peak runoff, whereas, you know, depending on the river, it might have been in early to mid June. Now that peak is shifting into mid to late May. So what does that mean? That means by the time you get to August and September, uh, you have much less water, it's hotter, it's drier, that impacts, you know, that whole riparian ecosystem. It also has an impact, of course, on forest fires. So that's just a, you know, example up, up sort of in your neck of the woods on how water is, is changing. And of course, all the producers, the farmers, the ranchers are, are acutely aware this it was one of my first talks i gave uh at montana state was i got to go to your weed and field day and i have to say you have not lived until you've gone to montana state university weed and field day so so i've got that i've got that t-shirt uh so so anyways all of that means that you know no matter how complex your subject is if you can if you can find a way that you know you're not going to capture everything but if you can capture the gist without misrepresenting things, but if you can capture the gist and let's say no more than three bullets, you know, and make that understandable to your audience, that can be a really useful thing. So here, here's my three things on like why the national security establishment or enterprise should care about climate risk or climate change. It changes our operating environment, right? The American way of war is we don't fight the home game, we fight the away game, but we want the home field advantage on the away game. So if the operating environment is changing and sort of the poster child for that, of course, is the Arctic because it used to be frozen and now it is not so much, uh, but there are, there are other places in the world that it's changing as well. We need to be ready, right? I mean, that's not like, I'm not talking about hugging whales or saving fish or anything like that. This is like inside the Pentagon, it's like the culture is you want to be ready and and this kind of resonates with that culture it's like oh okay this is about war fighting capability and readiness so i need to pay attention so that's what i would call operational risk so for an example uh the united states this is public knowledge uh, we have the capability and periodically operate our submarines under the sea ice in the arctic and because for you know millennia that has been a mostly frozen ocean, the sound conditions, the acoustics in the Arctic are very unique to the Arctic. And the United States has spent a lot of time and effort, money, developing tactics that make our submarines, frankly, very successful working in that environment. Well, now, as you melt the ice out, uh, warm the water, change the salinity, all of that has a tremendous impact on 
uh, the acoustics, which is the primary sensor of a submarine. So probably what you used to do, let's say in 1991 or 1981, not only will it not be successful, but it might very well get you killed uh, tactically. So it's like, okay, well, I probably want to pay attention to that. And I want to understand what it is now. And I want to understand where it's going so that as we develop our next generation of sensors and tactics, that we're kind of like staying abreast of those changes so that we don't get caught. And that's what I mean by changes to the operating environment. Impacts to bases and training places, it's kind of self-explanatory. I mean, for the Navy, uh, you know, not surprisingly, we tend to have a lot of our bases at sea level. It's where the ships are. Uh, I once said in a public meeting, you know, we're not like the Air Force. We can't just go to Minot, North Dakota, at which point in the audience, a gentleman raises his hand. It's like, I'm the city manager of Minot, North Dakota. Why don't you all come up? And sure enough, he gave me his business card at the end and he was a city manager. That was kind of weird. Uh, but we, you know, if the seas are rising, you have to pay attention to that. So of course, the, the most obvious, easiest thing to think of is like, oh my God, the piers at which you tie up are gonna go underwater. And yeah, and that's one thing you gotta look at, but it's a much more holistic look. It's like, okay, if you have a base, it's like a mini city. So where does the power come from? Texas wants to know that right now. Where does, uh, you know, where does your fresh water come from? Where does your sewer go to? Where do you get your internet? Where, do your, where does your connectivity uh, come from? Where do people live? You know, and what are the arteries that get them to and from that base? So the base itself could be okay, let's say for another 50 years, but if your main arteries, because of their relative elevation or the local hydrology of the of the town are going to go underwater unless the Department of Defense can work with that community and either strengthen them or do something, then, you know, it doesn't do you much good to have a base <laughs> if you can't have your sailors and your civilians uh, get there. And that actually is one of the main issues in Norfolk. Yes, with enough sea level rise, of course, the base itself will go underwater. But long before that, uh, there is one of the very main commuting roads called Hampton Boulevard, which is going to flood out and be impassable for about 40 to 50 percent of the workforce. So this is what I mean by we've got to look at this in a very holistic way. And again, it's not just sea level. Uh, wildfires and smoke have a huge issue. Excessive heat. If you have too much heat and humidity, you can't train your forces. If you can't train your forces, you don't get ready. So how do you mitigate that? And then finally, sort of these geostrategic risks. I call it making bad situations worse. If anybody's of a certain age on this uh, video, you might remember the old BASF commercials. We don't make things, we make things better. Climate change is sort of the opposite to that. We don't make things, we make things worse. And, you know, and there's a lot of places in the world in which, okay, it's all going to get bad. And you kind of say, well, yeah, that's, that's okay. But what are you going to do when something goes catastrophically bad? And I would argue Syria, you, you probably many of you in your class and readings have seen this. Syria went from never a great situation under Assad to an absolute catastrophe. It's a humanitarian catastrophe. It's a political, geopolitical catastrophe. The Russians are back in the Mediterranean for the first time in 30 years. Uh, we had, you know, ISIS, ISIL running around, running amok there for, for several years. Uh, as I said, and just down on the individual human level, it's it's horrific. Uh, so climate was part of that. And I have a slide, a, a few slides later that tries in very simple terms to, to I think, lay out some of the, the drivers of that. So those are my three reasons. Like if I'm in the Pentagon or if I'm testifying to Congress and I am asked, like, why should we care? Why, why isn't this just the Environmental Protection Agency's problem? or Noah's problem, or somebody else, but not my problem. <laughs> and this is this is what I tell them, that these are basically the three things. So I'm just gonna go through like a slide or two on each one of these. So, you know, here's an example with where the Arctic kind of combines those operational risks, but also 
also the geostrategic changes. So you have uh, Mr. Putin and Mr. Xi on the top left there. And I don't know how well that uh, picture comes out on your, on your screen. Uh, but if you can see that one of those gentlemen is smiling and one is not. And I think Putin was smart enough to know he was kind of had uh, in these negotiations. And the reason for that is when the West pulled out because of the sanctions, because of Crimea and Ukraine, China was the only game in town and the Chinese were smart enough to know that. And they drove what I understand from various sources and stuff, a very, very hard bargain with Russia for uh, technology and capital going into Russia and uh, huge amounts of natural gas coming out of Russia and into, into China there. So we have that. We have really Chinese working uh, very hard with uh, a lot of our Nordic allies. Uh, China wanted to buy the largest natural harbor in Iceland. And then when asked why, they said, well, we're going to build a golf course here. And of course, I mean, why wouldn't the Chinese build a golf course in Iceland? It just happened to be the largest harbor. Why are they so interested in that? Well, they're really thinking in 20, 30, 40 years about a trade route that basically goes straight over the top of the Arctic, at least seasonally, when the ice thaws out. You can basically go from, let's say, the Aleutian Islands across the top, and you would connect down into Greenland, Iceland, and basically the Atlantic trading routes. And if you can do this in ice-free conditions, you save about three weeks of shipping time uh, and the attendant costs and all that sort of thing. Uh, so again, there, this is an, a place, you know, I, I had uh, Greenland on here. I did have a slide in which I have a Trump hotel going into Greenland, but I don't think that's going to happen anymore. Uh, you know, so we try to, <laughs> you know, the good thing about the last administration is they at least figured out where Greenland was, and that was a, a good thing. Uh, but then stating on Twitter that you're going to buy the island was maybe not quite such a good thing. Uh, but Greenland is a very strategic location, and there is a big indigenous movement. I, I was very happy to hear uh, how we opened this presentation. Well, in Greenland also, there is a big indigenous movement, and there's a big independence movement. Uh, I don't know if anybody in the uh, audience there knows about how many native Greenlanders there are. It's 50,000. So 50,000 is about the number of undergraduate and graduate students we used to have on the Penn State campus pre-pandemic. Uh, it's not that many, but you look at, and yes, the Mercator projection, of course, distorts it, but even without being distorted, it's a pretty big chunk of land and it's in a very strategic place. And it's potential here in the next few years, you could, could have an independent country of 50,000 people who are they going to turn to? Are they going to turn to the Europeans? Are they going to turn to the Americans? Or are they going to turn to the Chinese for technical and financial support and even potentially security support? Uh, and the Chinese have been paying a lot of attention to Greenland. So that's just one, one example of sort of where uh, geostrategic and operational risks meet. Uh, something I started about a decade ago is this uh, organization we call the Arctic Security Forces Roundtable. If anybody knows anything about the Arctic Council, by definition within their charter, they do not and are not allowed to discuss what we call hard security issues, let's say military to military. So along with the Norwegians and some other components of the Secretary of Defense's, uh, I started a military to military uh, meeting in the Arctic. And this was, we held our meetings in Oslo and we had for the first time around a table, senior, when by senior I mean admirals or generals, uh, meeting from every country around, uh, around the Arctic. Uh, unfortunately, the United States ha now has a policy of no military to military contact with Russia, again, post Ukraine. Uh, so while the Arctic Security Forces Roundtable has met, meeting without Russia, and Russia has 50%, 5-0% of the coastline of the Arctic, uh, it kind of takes away some of the effectiveness of the group. But, but it exists, and uh, if things change or some way, you know, that is a, a structure 
that we can use to hopefully increase understanding and reduce tensions uh, through the militaries. So here's an infrastructure issue. And it's not, you know, normally when people show you infrastructure, they're going to show you a picture of like Norfolk Naval Base or, you know, maybe a, a army training range with a wildfire on it. And those are all very significant issues. I actually took this picture uh, about four years ago. I was on a uh, team that went over to work with the Norwegians on some Arctic issues. We were in uh, Bergen, Norway. So before I flew out, I actually had a little time to go Saturday morning, just walk around the harbor front. And I noticed that, you know, this was sort of a normal weather day. There wasn't anything really spectacular about it. This structure here is kind of underwater, <laughs> and that's the ocean uh, that it's in. And, you know, the Norwegians in their wonderfully understated way says, yes, it floods from time to time now. Uh, we don't really associate Norway with big sea level rise problems. You know, the poster child for that country would probably be Bangladesh, right? Everybody's heard of, oh my God. And that Bangladesh does have, they have a, a tremendous problem. But we think of Norway as like, oh, the Norwegians, they're great people, and they are, and they're great allies, and they are, and they're going to help us out whenever we, the United States, need help in that corner of the world. And they will to the extent they can. But my probably too long story here is the reason I bring this up is even countries that we don't think about with sea level rise are going to end up getting internally focused because this is going to cost them a lot of money, just like it's going to cost us a lot of money to deal with. And that is resources and time and effort and attention that is going to go inward and not outward so that when the United States, when we write all our strategies and we say we love our partners, and we love our allies because we don't want to do it all ourselves. Uh, well, the allies may be doing other things inside their own borders to deal with this stuff. And I haven't really heard people talk about that. So that's sort of a, another impact of this whole infrastructure risk. Now, I mentioned, you know, the whole geostrategic part. So this is my amazingly simple slide. This, this slide probably wouldn't even get you, it certainly wouldn't get you a master's degree or a PhD because I'd need about 200 pages to go with it and all that sort of thing. Uh, but when you think about which climate events have created very big geostrategic risks and also which have not, this slide to me kind of makes sense. So you get a climate impact. And usually what I tell people is the pointy end of a climate change is usually manifest in some type of extreme weather. Hurricane, typhoon, storm surge, sea level, really hot, occasionally really cold, uh, something like that. Drought, you know, and to, you know, within bounds, humans, human infrastructure, human civilization, you know, we can account for stuff. And of course, geographically, and this has played out very dramatically in the US just this week, you know, if you're in Minneapolis or in Bozeman, you know, a week of zero below zero temperatures is uncomfortable. But I was not reading here how you guys have no power because every one of your power plants froze up. Why? Because you built them so that they would run <laughs> in, uh, you know, in cold weather because you're in Montana. This is not too hard to figure out, right? So you guys, while it was cold, you did not exceed, let's say, a threshold, an operating threshold for the power plants. I'm sure they had to do some things. It was more expensive. But you, you guys kept the lights on, as did the Dakotas in Minneapolis during this cold spell. Our buddies in Texas, that same cold exceeded their threshold. They were not built. And there'll be lots of things written and said and talked about in the coming weeks and months and probably years as to whether they should or should not or whatever. That's not the point of this. But the point is, is they exceeded a threshold. And now you have, last I checked about two hours ago, 3.4 million people in Texas without power. And it wasn't because of an ice storm. It's because the power plants can't run because it's too cold. <laughs> uh, so that's a threshold. So now you have a bunch of really unhappy people. So what's the government response? Well, I did read of one small mayor that said, it's not my problem and the, only the strong shall survive and the weak shall perish. 
Uh, thank goodness he was of a very small West Texas town and he's also resigned. Uh, because if that becomes the national response, you're going to get a pretty ugly uh, response. It's sort of what happened in Syria. Syria basically said to the drought and the farmers, you're on your own. And that's when groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda moved in and said, I will take care of you, you know, and you have desperate people. They have no food, no security, no home, no shelter, no nothing. And you have this group that says, I will take care of you. I would argue any of us could look in the mirror and say, what would we have done? We may very well have said, I'll, I'll sign up for that. So you want a government response that's helpful. And when I say government, that can also include the international community. Uh, so whether it's the US or Western Europe or Japan or Australia, but is there useful aid? And then how does that impact the society response and how do these things feed into each other? So I hope that makes a little bit of sense because like when we had the massive droughts in uh, Syria that led to this catastrophe, at the same time, if you remember about a decade ago, we had some horrifically bad droughts in California, but we did not have ISIS and ISIL going through the streets of Fresno and Bakersfield and Los Angeles. And I would argue that you know, imperfect as it was, the state government and the federal government responded and responded enough to take the worst of those impacts for the farmers and for the state uh, out so that we maintain, frankly, uh, civil society and stability. And we were not talking about, uh, you know, huge, huge, massive government changes like, like what happened in Syria. So, it, it's this multi-stage thing, and a lot of times it's really easy to like zero in on one piece of this, but I think all of these pieces are, are equally important, and if and without it, it's, it's easy to come to the wrong conclusion. So happy to talk about that more in Q&A if anybody wants, uh, but that's my, my very, very simplistic theory on how climate risks and climate impacts can or sometimes do not why they do not create big geostrategic problems. Uh, here's another way that I sometimes think about climate. This one, I, this slide I happen to do for migration, but, but it could be, uh, you know, you, you could look at it for, for other, other issues as well. So it's like this very simple two by two matrix. So like, I don't know if Montana State has a business school, but if you have any business school, uh, majors, they love this sort of thing, right? Two by two matrix, there's no actual values or like, you know, anything like that. So it's a great business school thing. Uh, but you have direct and indirect effects and you have either, it happens really fast, like in hours, days, maybe a week or two versus chronic. So, you know, I mean, and you can kind of see the words on there. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read them to you, but direct is sort of like what you would think of, you know, hurricane or typhoon comes and it strikes the coast of Texas or Florida or Mississippi. You know, that's a that's a direct boom. And what happens, you know? Well, you get a storm surge and that can come in and, you know, that will come in in a matter of hours and it can do, you know, millions, billions of dollars of damage. And if people are still there, it can kill many people as well. It can be catastrophic, you know, but it's on top of this sort of slow onset of sea level rise. So it's coming in. So even for the same storm, it's coming in a little bit higher as the years and decades go by. But this chronic issues also have issues that, you know, you might not instantaneously think of, like saltwater intrusion. And what I mean by that is as the sea level comes up gradually, you know, let's say half a meter to a meter in uh, by the end of this decade, could be a little more than that in places for sure. Uh, that's more pressure, right? You know, as water comes up, there's more pressure. And in a lot of places like Florida, the, the freshwater aquifers, this is true of California too, are really close to the coast. And as you pressurize the water just offshore, that actually forces water and salty water into those freshwater aquifers. And you can imagine that once you salt up an aquifer, it's like putting salt into, you know, take your, take your drinking water glass, right? and put salt in it, do you get that salt out? No, I mean, once it's in, it's in. 
and that aquifer frankly becomes much less useful or even useless for uh you know for human human consumption so that's an that's a place in which this chronic issues can still be just as important as storm surge but they happen on very very different timelines and then again you can read sort of these these indirect things it may not be the storm surge but it might be a crop failure it might be disease vectors and and again you can see how how these would change so sometimes i've found when trying to think through especially thinking through the impacts of climate uh this sort of two by two construct can be quite useful like if you've got a room of people you know maybe it's a zoom room now but you know if you had back in the old days when you had real people in a real room you know you could take real sticky notes and you could start putting them into these four corners and then you can start seeing okay which ones you know it's just as a way to kind of think about it and one of sort of my themes is how do we take really complex things and make them simple enough that we can sort of get the essence of because otherwise you know and i, I you know i taught at penn state for seven years so i mean i you know i was in academia and all this kind of stuff i got professor in my title you know it's easy in the academia in the think tanks to sort of delve into the nuance and there is a ton of nuance in this stuff and it's good to know and we need to know it but it needs to be in like chapters two and three and four and five and when you're giving that executive summary again to somebody who may not even know like why are you in the room and why did they take this meeting you want to kind of stay out of that nuance and keep it simple for them, at least to start with. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, since we've just changed administrations, of course, we're what, not even, not even a month into the new administration. And I've got a few calls, including from a few months ago from the transition team of like, what should we do? What should we do for the DOD? And it turns out that especially in Obama's second term, a lot was done as far as thinking about this. They didn't put any money into this, but they had what I called exquisite bureaucracy. So we had strategies and roadmaps and, you know, and directives and instructions and all this kind of stuff. And some of them are actually pretty good. So there is, you know, I'm not going to bore you with that, the, the numbers, but there is actually a climate change adaptation and resilience directive in the Department of Defense. And what that means in plain English is everybody who's part of the DOD should be doing this. And it lays out really by service and whether you're the Joint Chiefs of Staff and whether you're any of the key offices within the Pentagon, what you should be doing and i've read it several times it's actually good the guy who signed it out was the deputy secretary of defense bob work he's a friend of mine it's good they didn't do anything but it's good and then of course we get to the now previous administration and there was much drama are we going to cancel this are we going to do this oh my god well they basically did nothing so it's still on the books so like now when the Biden team comes in, they can say, see this document? Oh, by the way, it's in effect. <laughs> Tell me, you know, in two weeks, what are you doing to do this stuff? That will get the bureaucracy going, showing interest, showing some leadership on there. I mean, these climate, so these climate change roadmaps and Arctic roadmaps I have down at the bottom, I wrote those in 2009 and 2010. And I actually went through them pretty recently you know, if the Navy wants to know what to do, they could go find their documents from a decade ago and actually go do it. That would that would be a concept. Uh, you know, the how to do it does get harder. This is just from the Department of Defense's uh, internal organization manuals. This is how they're set up. This is just a piece of the, a small piece of the DOD. And no, there's not a test. It's not going to be on your midterm. Uh, you don't have to tell me what blocks are what, but it gets horribly complex. So unless you have at the top of the organization, somebody who is going to exert what I call a demand signal. So like this is your boss or your boss's boss, let's say once a month or, you know, once every six weeks saying, hey, Bob, hey, Sue, 
How's that climate stuff, I asked a guy. Tell me how it's going. Uh, let's see, we're gonna have a meeting at three o'clock on Friday and you're gonna tell me all the great stuff that's going on. That will get action, right? Uh, I tell people the Pentagon, if nothing else, is a hierarchical organization, unlike academia. And what that means is if your boss is interested, you are fascinated. Uh, so, the boss needs to be interested, though, because everybody below the boss, and there's, you know, millions of them <laughs> below the Secretary of Defense, if the boss is not interested, the, the same holds true. People figure out this is not something the boss wants to do, and it will just disappear. So, you know, that climate change directive, it's an effect, but everybody figured out really quick the boss is not interested, so nothing happened. So the how to do it is, is non-trivial. Uh, but really making sure you have key advocates. Uh, you know, I have, I have advised the Biden administration, like when they're interviewing the next set of four stars, because the four stars, you know, they change out every two or three years, depending on their job. Ask them, ask them, and, and it's an interview. It's just like a job interview, like I'm sure many of you have already done. Uh, ask them their views on climate. It, you know, pertaining to the job that they're going to go into. And if they give you some like, ah, that's some, you know, leftist wishy-washy tree hugger nonsense, thank them for their time and then you can show them the door. Uh, you know, pick people who are going to, in fact, do this because you cannot run this just from the White House. You cannot run this just from a congressional committee. You have to get people inside whatever the enterprises, and I'm talking, of course, the DOD here, but whatever the enterprise is, you've got to get people uh, who are going to actually do this. So there's a very famous business book called uh, Good to Great. I don't know if anybody's heard it or, or read about it. It's actually a very good leadership book. But one of the tenets, like tenant number two, I think, is get the right people on the bus. And and I have recommended to the incoming or this current administration that it's important you make sure you have the right people on the bus. Otherwise, uh, you know, there'll be a lot of bureaucracy, but nothing will happen. Okay, uh, let's see here. Yeah, so I'll keep going. So here's, here's some lessons. So I wrote an article last September in this, I was asked to in this journal, the Dalius. Uh, and again, you can kind of see the bullets and I've talked about some of them already, but if you don't want to read my 15 page article, there's the, there's the bullets. I'm sorry, it's not three, I, I have five. Uh, but, you know, this idea about, and, and I see this sometimes with activists, is how do you talk to a group that you're trying to influence about something they are interested in, not you. And, and I'll get strong pushback from some people and, and, that's, and that's fine. Uh, but people, and in, especially in the climate community, but in other areas as well, they get very, very passionate about this stuff. And they think about it in their way and they're gonna tell you that. And that's great, but if you're trying to change somebody you know, telling them they're dumb or they're stupid or they're all wrong. You know, how many of us have been told that? And what's our normal reaction? <laughs> you, know, did, you know, who has said, you know, you're right. I really am stupid and dumb and wrong. So I'm going to change tomorrow. I'm not saying it never happens, but not too often, right? As opposed to, you know, you want to be a major league baseball player, don't you? It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of on the varsity team. Okay, well, this is what you need to really be thinking about. You know, if you take into account whatever it is, whether it's social justice or climate or whatever, I think that's actually going to help you achieve your goals. Well, why is that? Well, you know, you're going to, let's say if it was social justice, you're gonna probably now look for different coaches who may not look for look like you. You're gonna have a wider net of people who can help you out as an example. I mean, I, I know this is climate, and not, not social justice, but the idea is to frame it in something that your organization or the, your target organization is interested in. 
So again, you know, back to the Navy and back to the Department of Defense, I talk about climate change in terms of war fighting readiness. That's what they care about. Uh, you know, and they need to, they need to be ready. And similarly, I use, you know, use their language, not mine. So my language of a scientist, you know, I can talk about Keeling curves and I can talk about partial differential equations and I can talk about, you know, all kinds of different numerical models and why some are good and some aren't good. And I love that stuff because I've been a weather geek since I was about four years old. And myself and another professor at Penn State, we've got this ongoing text conversation right now about how much snow we're going to get in central Pennsylvania tomorrow. It's wonderful. I love this stuff. But it wouldn't be the language that would convince anyone else if they would just like scratch their head and it's like, what are you talking about? Get out of here. So talk about whether it's climate or whatever your issue is, what's their language? What are their values? And, and use that. Messengers matter. Uh, one of the ways I was able to get away with talking about climate change is I was an admiral. That counts for something in the Pentagon. You know, and within the Navy, uh, it's a big deal, like what tribe you come from and tribe, I mean, like surface warfare or you fly jets or you, you know, drive submarines. So I was a member of sort of two of these tribes. I, I've driven aircraft carriers and destroyers and all that sort of thing for my career. And I was also in the information warfare business. And, you know, unlike civilians, we got little things, you know, you've seen pictures of military uniforms and they got all this crap on them, right? Well, all that crap actually means something to other people in the military and they can kind of look at you in about two seconds and it's like, oh, he or she's actually done something with their life. Maybe I should I'll at least give them the courtesy of listening. Uh, so having that messenger, whereas, you know, I could have had one of my academic friends from Penn State or Montana State go in with the exact same message you know, and they would have probably had hair like now the length that mine is and, you know, and probably had the those those great professor, you know, the the patches on the the elbow patches. I love those. My wife will let me wear them, though. Uh, but, you know, and, it, and it's like people may still be outwardly polite, but inwardly, you know, they're doing the oh, my God, I roll academic and they've tuned out. They probably tuned out unless they had some pre-existing relationships. So the messenger matters. You know, change, you can read that. Change is hard. Uh, and the Congress is, the Congress and the White House, if you're working in DC within the government, you have to work with both. It's not one or the other. And I don't know if we'll see better alignment. Uh, in Obama administration, of course, we had President Obama with tremendous rhetoric on climate, even climate and security but a Congress that was adamantly opposed. That and then we went through four years with a president who uh, was not predisposed to work in climate, I'll just say that. Uh, but under the radar, we actually got a fair amount of legislation into the National Defense Authorization Act, basically the, the act that authorizes and funds the armed services every year. Uh, that was climate friendly. You don't hear about it. And that was actually a strategy of ours is not to make a big deal of this. And it was kind of put in and it's all very technocratic and things like that, but it was actually quite helpful. Uh, so we need to work with both. And uh, people who just say, well, the hell with the congressional branch or the hell with the executive branch, uh, it may make you feel good, but it's probably not going to get there. So I'm going to just wrap this up here. Uh, and I like this quote from Admiral Nimitz. So he's the guy on the left. He's talking to Admiral Halsey. He's the guy on the right. Admiral Halsey is the guy who ran his strike group through a typhoon in de uh, December of 44, uh, actually killed hundreds of sailors because he got caught in this typhoon. Three ships sunk. Uh, hundreds of aircraft. It was basically more damage than the Japanese caused us until we got from Pearl Harbor until Okinawa. Uh, and uh, you can read you can read the quote, but you know nothing's more dangerous than for a seaman to be begrudging and taking precautions. And that's kind of how I look at climate. 
My guess is there are more than a few people in Texas, and that's how they're now looking at their energy system. Uh, you know, it's easy to not do something until bad things happen. And once bad things happen, it's usually too late to go back and try to prepare. So, you know, and you learn this at sea. Uh, my grandmother always used to tell me that worse things happen at sea, you know, and something minor happened to her. And she was right. Uh, you know, if you're not careful, it will kill you. The sea is absolutely remorseless. And the climate is going to change. I tell people that, you know, the climate does not care whether it's a Democrat or a Republican in the White House or a Democrat or Republican controlling the Congress, the ice just melts. So the climate absolutely does not care one bit who our political leadership is or is not. It's just going to keep doing what the laws of physics say. And if we don't prepare and while it was not the subject of this, but I would argue, and if we don't reduce our greenhouse gases uh, pretty quickly, uh, we are going to simply have to suffer more and more and more. There are basically three things we can do. We can adapt, we can mitigate, and we can suffer. And, you know, we have control of all those three knobs. Right now, we've kind of turned the suffering up, and we need to turn that one down and turn the other two up. So with that, uh, why isn't that working? Who knows? Uh, it won't go to the last slide. That's okay. We'll just leave this as the last slide. So let's stop there. Uh, what do we have? 10, 15 minutes, whatever you guys want for questions or, I mean, I'm, I'm like, whatever, whatever you guys want. Uh, so I'm happy to, happy to, uh, have any comments, questions, uh, whatever you guys would like. Yeah, everybody, if you have questions, just go ahead and drop them into the chat, and then um, Kai and I will take turns and we'll ask the questions to Admiral Titley and get your answers. So, ask away. <laughs> or not. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. Jeopardy's on, and I can go to go watch Jeopardy. Okay, we do have a question. <laughs> we do have a question. Okay, Jeopardy will just have to wait. The question is, how soon do we have to act based on your experience? Uh, that's, you know, yesterday would be better. Today is good. Tomorrow is less good. But tomorrow is better than the day after. And I know that sounds a little flip. Uh, but really, it's how much risk and how much suffering do you want to take. So the more and more we delay, the more, frankly, suffering and extreme weather we are we are building in to the uh, to the system. So, you know, I mean, that's that's you know, it's it's not that we fall off a cliff at one point five or two or two point two five. It's more like and I wrote an article in the conversation uh, about this a few years ago, but it's more like coming down like, you know, one of those steep Rocky Mountain passes and you're a coal truck or something. Uh, let's say the truck speed limit coming down the pass is 20 miles an hour and cars can go 50 something. Uh, you know, so if you're a truck and you're coming down at 20, then life is good. Well, if you're a truck and you're coming down at 25, you know, honestly, you're probably going to be okay. 30, you're probably okay, but it might be a little more exciting ride. 40, you know, it's getting really sporting. And at some point, you're going to fall off the road here, and it's going to be a really, really bad day. So that's by waiting and waiting. You know, we're kind of that big truck coming down the hill faster and faster. Does it mean that we're going to have a disaster? Not necessarily. But I would argue that uh, while yesterday was the best day to start, today is the next best day. And I would start today. OK, so the next question we have is, what's your reaction to the Biden administration canceling Keystone XL and other pipeline projects? Yeah, I mean, the, I don't get that involved in it. In you know, in the sense that if there's enough of a demand for those fossil fuels, they will find a way to market. We do know that pipelines are honestly safer than rail cars, but a good reason not to build the Keystone pipelines 
is that once you put infrastructure in, you know, unless the government or somebody is going to frankly pay that private entity or corporation, you know, what they would have made on that infrastructure for 20, 30, 40 years, it's probably going to get used. So if you can not put the capital into that infrastructure, the banks and the corporations won't be looking for that 25, 30, 40 year payout. And if we do need to get to net zero, let's say in 20 to 30 years, you know, we should be very strategic as to what infrastructure we do and do not need now. And, and managing this transition is going to be messy. I was going to say tricky. It will be tricky and it's going to be messy because it's not obvious which pieces you put in. We clearly don't just turn everything off because we all don't want to be like Texas right now. Uh, and we're not going to be. We're not going to do that. Uh, and nobody, nobody in this administration or any administration has said that we're going to do that. But if you're going to transition, at some point you got to stop talking about transitioning and do it. And that means that you need to stop putting in legacy, uh, legacy infrastructure that those banks and companies are going to be looking for a 30-year return on. Uh, so that's the you know, those are the issues, you know, tactically is Keystone XL the right thing to say no to? I mean, I know there's a lot of other politics in there. I don't know. But those are the things. At some point, you've got to say, okay, guys, we're going to, we need to move on here. And, and that's, that's the issue. Next question. Which part of this topic has been hardest for you to adapt to the lexicon and values of the Navy? Ah, uh, when I would, that's a good question. I don't think I've been asked that actually. Uh, I would say when we had in about a decade ago, we had a secretary of the Navy, Secretary Mabus, who was doing this big, big initiative on biofuels. And he was going to have what they called the great green fleet. He was going to run a strike force around the world that was not going to use any conventional fossil fuels. So we take a nuclear powered aircraft carrier, which of course, you know, is, is using nuclear power and the conventional ships and the aircraft flying off of this would all go on biofuels, you know, especially a decade ago, but even now, uh, it wasn't totally clear one, what the carbon footprint to produce those biofuels really was, uh, the cost was about 20 times per gallon greater than conventional fuel. This is a very expensive thing to, to do. And from a war fighting capability, it doesn't buy us anything. And the reason for that is if you, you know, if you're out in the middle of the ocean and you're flying your planes and steaming them hard, whether they're on conventional fossil fuels or green biofuels, you've got to get that liquid fuel in an, in an oil tanker, a, mil, a military oil tanker from wherever you made it or stored it, let's say Hawaii or Guam, if we're out in the Pacific, to those ships. And that oil tanker is every bit as vulnerable, whatever it's carrying. So unfortunately, the Secretary of the Navy was making this he was trying to couch this in war fighting terms. And anybody who actually knew anything about war fighting knew that that was, what's the technical term? Bullshit. Uh, so uh, that, was, that was hard, harder to defend. Uh, the better way to defend it is not that we're gonna have the great green fleet, but it is in the Navy's interest as it's in America's and the world's interest to reduce greenhouse gases. But the fact is, is there is gonna be some things like aircraft, maybe heavy trucks, we'll see where battery goes on that, but certainly aircraft that probably are not going to be powered by batteries in the foreseeable future. So if we could have, uh, carbon neutral fuels, I'll just call it that, or a carbon neutral system, that would be advantageous to, to everybody. Uh, and, you know, and there's a lot of analogs that are used, they're imperfect, but, you know, DARPA helped with the transistor back in the 60s with the microchip, 
chip with GPS, with the internet, of course, everybody kind of knows those stories, but they were done because there was an immediate military need back in the 60s or 70s or 80s that that's why the DOD got it in. It wasn't, you know, nobody sat down in the Pentagon in 1983 and said, you know what would be better? It would be better if the world could show cat videos. So we're going to tell DARPA to go and invent this internet thing. That is not how it happened. Uh, so, so there needs to be the military connection, and it was pretty fuzzy with what those biofuels were doing. So thanks for the question. That's actually a pretty, that's a question I haven't had before. Okay, so our next question is, what are some steps that should be taken at the individual and national levels to mitigate the effects of climate change? So, yeah, so what we need to do is, is the national level is very, very important. I mean, and it's great that we can do individual things, and I will talk about that in, in a second. But, you know, we are producing, I should know this number by heart, but it's gigatons of carbon dioxide. I think it's like 20, 20 or 30, don't quote me on that. But it's, it's, it's in that range. It's this 20, 30 gigatons, billions of tons of carbon dioxide each year. You and me, by ourselves, are not going to change the first or the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth or the sixth or even the seventh or eighth significant digit of that. Now, we can do things, but we're, you know, we're really down into the weeds. So there needs to be, and, and there are different levers to do this, whether it is a price on carbon, which the economists love and the politicians hate, whether it is targets for fuel efficiency and regulation, or even, you know, telling uh, telling the country you're going to go zero fossil fuel cars and light duty trucks by the year such and such, so a regulatory way. There are different ways to do this that will really bend this curve. How you generate power. Uh, that will, I mean, power is, I think, 35 or 40 percent of our CO2 emissions. I mean, the kind of what you want to do is, I understand it, talking to people who really work the energy side of this, is you want to electrify everything and then make sure you have enough electri electric capacity generated by non-carbon based sources. And oh, by the way, it'd be nice if it's reliable uh, so that you can then run run everything that you can electrify. I mean, that's the big picture. And then you start working on these one ofs, like what do we do with aviation? You know, flight shaming is not really gonna be a, a long-term solution. Uh, but, you know, so whether it's biofuel that really is carbon neutral and somebody can actually show it's carbon neutral, uh, do, you know, if, if the price of carbon is let's say $100 a ton, you know you can start looking at some of these carbon sequestration projects. You basically take the CO2, concentrate it, and you can either reuse it for industrial purposes or you stick it in the ground and you mineralize it and it gets locked back up uh, for tens of thousands of years. And you know, that might be the price you pay. If you want to burn fossil fuel, fine, but you're going to pay $100 a ton to lock it back up. And we already have the technology that works at that price level. So the National Academies did a pretty big study on that. So I don't know that it's going to be biofuels. I don't know it's going to be a price on carbon, but those are the big things. Individually, what I tell people to do is do what you can. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I moved to this house about nine years ago. I'm one block off Penn State, you know, kind of like that nice residential area that you guys have in Bozeman with all those craftsmen, craftsmen houses down by the university. And mine, sort of like those houses, it's a 1940s house, 1930s, 1940s house. When we moved in here, every window was single pane. Uh, there was no insulation in big chunks of the house. So we've put in double pane windows, we've insulated the thing, we've put in more efficient heating system. You know, that all I know has reduced significantly our personal carbon footprint. When I chose this house, I was able to walk to work. Uh, 
So my office, when I, when I taught, is 15 minute walk away from here. So my carbon footprint for my commute is zero. Uh, and for the same money that we had in our budget, you know, we could have lived six, seven miles out in town. We could have had a half acre, blah, blah, blah. But then I'd be driving every day. Now, the main reason I didn't want to drive is that mean I would have a parking pass and I'd have to pay the university for parking again. And I think I had probably paid more in parking than I did in tuition when I was an undergraduate at Penn State. And it turns out that you do not get your transcript until you pay all your parking tickets, even though you've graduated. So just a little, little pro tip there. My guess is Montana State probably does something similar. So I, I was actually at the age of 22, was bound and determined that I was never gonna pay Penn State another dollar in parking. And, and so far I've been successful in that. So, you know, do these things you can do. The other thing individually you can do is whenever you have a chance to interact with your elected officials at any level, ask them, ma'am or sir, what are you doing to stabilize the climate? So, you know, it's sort of like dating 101. It's not a yes or no question. It's an open-ended question. You might get a decent answer. You might not. But at the very least, in that politician's brain, you know, you as a voter had a chance to ask about anything, and you asked about climate. And that does register. I've talked to so many either active or former members of Congress. They do listen to what their constituents care about. They're also very good at figuring out what their constituents do not care about. And I tell people, if enough people care enough, we will get action very quickly on this, and then we can get to that national. So let me stop there on that one. The next, the next question, pardon me, um, should be a pretty quick one, but what is the last slide a picture of? So, what are we, what picture do you see? Is it a blue top with the words thank you on it? Because my screen, I think, is frozen. What, what are you guys, what are you seeing? That's what we see. We see the That's what, oh, okay, you are seeing it. Okay, somehow my, my screen froze on the previous slide. So what that is, is I got to go to the Navy's ISEX in 2011. So we flew from D Washington, D.C., to Anchorage, to Fairbanks, got on another plane to go to Prudhoe Bay, got on a, a little ski equipped plane and we flew a hundred miles north over the ice onto the Arctic Ocean, landed, got in a helicopter, went another five miles and here we are out on the ice and this whole thing was designed so that we could watch that submarine surface through the ice. And what you see there is a picture I took. This is about midday, and you can see how long the shadows are. And that black thing is the conning tower of the USS Connecticut coming up through the, uh, through the ice there. So that's what the picture is. So, you know, being the Navy, of course, you have to have a safety brief. And the guy who was running this said, okay, we're pretty sure over here about, you know, half a click or so, that's where the submarine's going to come up. But he said, but if you hear the ice cracking behind you, then we're going to run in this direction. And that's where you realize that you're standing <coughs> on about five feet of ice and underneath you is about 3000 feet of water that's 28 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's like, hmm, there's nobody, no place to hide. Oh, and it's minus 30. It's just, and it doesn't matter if it's Celsius or Fahrenheit, it's just minus 30 out there. So that's what the picture is. I, okay, I didn't, I didn't know you guys could see that. I'm glad you can. Awesome. All right, next question. When talking about climate change, we hear a lot about environmental changes in the western half of the country. Can you think of any major examples of climate change in the eastern half of the country? Oh, yeah. So uh, the eastern half of the country, what you're seeing is, you know, huge sea level rise issues. So Norfolk, Virginia, which is the uh, western hemisphere's largest naval base, is also ground zero for sea level rise for a whole variety of reasons. You have global sea level rise, everybody has that. The, uh, you have a local effect because as the Gulf Stream current slows down, that's actually adding some effective sea level rise to, uh, uh, to the sort of middle Atlantic coast. 
And then for reasons that have nothing to do with climate change, the land on the middle Atlantic is actually sinking. So you're getting an effective rate of sea level rise around Norfolk, Virginia of almost double that of most other places in the world. So this is a huge issue. Uh, Miami, Florida has a huge issue. Uh, I don't know if you guys hear about, but they have what they call sunny day flooding or they blame it on the moon. I mean, I've actually watched a TV report blaming the flooding in Miami on the moon. And it's because, you know, and you probably know that on new moons and full moons, the tides are slightly higher. But as the water comes up, even on a perfectly clear, calm day, the sea levels are now high enough that they're flooding into the streets of Miami and Norfolk and places like this. Uh, so sea level rise is a hell of an issue out here. Uh, there's a lot of debate and increasing evidence that when we get hurricanes, the numbers may or may not change in a changed climate. But when you get a hurricane, the chance of that hurricane being bigger and stronger and wetter is, is uh, increasing. There's increasing evidence that all of those things happen. So bigger and stronger means a much bigger storm surge that comes in on top of a higher sea level. Wetter, you know, think Hurricane Harvey, where Houston got three, four, five feet of rain. I mean, just, you know, I mean, that's basically incomprehensible how much rain that they got. Uh, so we're seeing all of those kinds of, uh, kinds of issues. I would say those are the, those are some of the biggest issues out out here. We do not have the wildfires and there's really no evidence at least in the next say few decades that we're going to get them because we get enough rain and if anything the northeast Pennsylvania, New York where I am, we're getting wetter and wetter. Uh, so you know we're getting different kinds of bugs and uh, disease vectors that come up uh, but it's wet enough that probably we're not going to have a fire danger like, like unfortunately the, the West has. But those are those are just some of the some of the climate impacts that we're seeing out here. So the next question we had was one of your points was that your title is important. The messenger matters. I am intending to go into climate activism after I graduate next year. But I know that if I want to hit the ground running, I won't have a chance to go for a PhD, go into the military, etc. How do we as young people earn credibility to speak about these issues? Yeah, that's that's a great, it's a really, really good question. And I don't know that I'm the best person to answer it because I did like 25 years in the Navy before I was asked to address climate. Uh, I would say though, that if you can work, uh, let's say the congressional committee, you know, you build your reputation there. If you can work with, let's say, one of the larger non-governmental organizations, you know, and I'm not, you know, let's say a CSIS, uh, Center for Naval, or uh, C Center for New American Security, uh, CNA, that one of the uh, federally funded research and development organizations, RAND. You know, those kind of organizations, and you do good there, and within your community, you're going to build, you're going to start, and you're going to build a really good reputation, you know, and that will count. It's like, hey, I know Sarah, you know, I've, I've read her reports. They're great reports. They're well-written. Uh, she does great work. So if she's talking about this climate thing, well, maybe I should listen, you know, maybe I should, maybe I should at least listen to her. So I would say those one with the huge caveat that I may not be the best person to answer this, you know, go, go ask, I would say, go find people who have gone into these fields directly out of college, bring them back to campus or get them on zoom or whatever we're on. And, you know, when they're, let's say 30 years old, so they've been out, let's say seven, eight, nine years, something like that. Ask them how that worked out for them. But, but I would say establish credibility where wherever wherever you are. But understanding then that you know it's hard if you're a twenty-something year old and let's say you've worked for Greenpeace to go knock on the door of the Pentagon 
and get an audience with somebody senior and they're going to listen to you. I'm not saying it can't happen, but that's going to be a challenge. But you can influence a lot of other people, not just the Pentagon. Great. Next question. What countries have taken the most initiative to lessen their impact on the environment? Are other countries choosing not to change their, their ways or are they just unable to? Good, good question. Uh, I think some of the smaller countries have actually done really well. Like Costa Rica has done really well. Uh, I mean, both on biodiversity, but also on meaningful reductions on their CO2 footprint. Uh, Europe seems to be doing good, but in general, Europe talks a great game, but they, their actions don't always follow through. But maybe that's changing. I mean, we've seen that the United Kingdom has, Great Britain has basically phased out coal from their energy grid. You know, and coal is what started the Industrial Revolution in Great Britain in the late 1700s. So it's pretty amazing, actually, to think about that they are not are not doing that. Uh, so I think their Europe is certainly one. They talk about it well, and I think they're doing some things pretty pretty good. It will be interesting to see if Norway what really goes all electric vehicle, what is it, by 2030, 2035, something like that. I think that's what they're, uh, what they're aiming for there. So, so I would say Europe in general is doing pretty good. It's very hard for me to tell what China is or is not doing. Yes, they've got huge renewables, but they have massive conventional as well because they're just trying to electrify so much. And the thing that they were really working on at least a few years ago was reducing particulate matter, you know, and if they could probably make it cleaner fuel, then that's that's better. But what was happening is is a lot of the population was very, very unhappy with just how dirty the air was. We've all seen those pictures out of Beijing uh, and the Communist Party is terrified of losing what uh, what they call the mandate from heaven. And this is how dynasties have fallen in China for thousands of years is the dynasty loses the mandate from heaven. Everybody who is in the government gets their head cut off and you start a new dynasty. The Communist Party does not want to be the latest in that series to lose that. So when people get really unhappy, you can either clamp down on them or you can try to address that grievance. And they do they do plenty of both but they have tried to clean up their energy system, but I don't think it was so much to do for climate as it was to solve this near-term particulate matter. Uh, Australia goes up and down, sort of like, Australia is like Americans, but they're down and they have a funny accent. Uh, their government keeps switching back and forth between more liberal and more conservative. They've had a number of conservatives that have said, this is all BS, we're not doing anything. Then they have a liberal government come in and it's like they create the department or the ministry of climate change and then four years later it gets disestablished because the government flips sound familiar so they're in some ways like us they have a lot of serious people who really see this as an issue they've got of course the great barrier reef which has undergone some huge bleaching events because of these warm waters that we're getting now uh and they had horrific what they call bushfires, wildfires, what was it? Uh, beginning of 2020, how could we forget? Uh, but that was, we all thought that was gonna be the story of 2020 was just those incredibly devastating fires they had about, what, 13 months ago down in, uh, down in Australia. And I don't know, I haven't gone down to Australia for a few years now, but I don't know if that was a big enough event that kind of like shook the mindset of the populace and it's like oh geez we better we better really start paying attention here uh so it's always good for whomever asks a question it's a great question and it's always good to not only see what people are saying but also look for that country or that region what are they doing and and sometimes they're aligned and sometimes they're not i'll just say that Okay, and I believe this might be our final question is, what are your thoughts on the Paris Climate Accord? Is it a good thing that Biden rejoined it? 
<laughs> okay, that's a good question. I actually did when we first signed up. So I guess this would have been what, 2015, 2016. Uh, I was invited with uh, the dean of the Penn State Law School to go to New York City. And we did, I was the token scientist in this room full of lawyers and law degree students. Uh, and we had this whole panel discussion. And what I said, and I still kind of believe it, is that the, the Paris agreements are sort of the ultimate Rorschach test on this. And you know, you can make a very convincing argument that this is in fact signed by virtually every country in the world. And we have all said, look, this is a problem and we all need to start addressing it. And that's, you know, that's great, right? That's the first step. If you want to argue against Paris, you say, look, even if everybody does these nationally defined contributions, I think they're INDCs, uh, at best, we're only cutting the warming to three degrees Celsius. So this document says two degrees, but higher ambition is 1.5 degrees. But what you signed up for is three degrees. And oh, by the way, there's not even any penalties for blowing that off. There's, there's no, you know, we don't even say you're a bad boy. You know, there's, there's, there's like no penalty at all. So people have said, look, if this is the existential crisis, you've written an absolutely toothless treaty that does nothing. Uh, and, you know, so this is, this is not even worth the paper it's written on. And then the other side says, well, do you have anything better? Well, no, there isn't. So it's like, well, we'll start with this. And, and I'm <clears throat> sure anyone who's looked at this says, you know, in subsequent meetings, we're supposed to like ratchet you know, be more specific in what the contributions are and also ramp them up to get to these idealized goals of plus two or even plus 1.5. So my, my view was it's probably, it's certainly better than nothing, okay? It's a good step. No one should think that Paris solves the climate issue, but it's a step on a road. It's like, when you pass that first quarter mile mark of a marathon, it's like, hey, hey, I'm a quarter mile into the marathon. Okay, keep going. Uh, but you're on the track, right? You're on the track and you're running and you've, and you've left the start gate and that's good. Uh, so, so it has that. I thought it was bad to pull out. And again, I can, I can argue that the merits of Paris don't really do much good. But I think it's a very bad place for lots of geostrategic reasons for the U.S. not to be at these international tables. Because if we're not there, that vacuum gets filled by others. And I'm not sure that's in the United States' interest. That's my personal opinion. So I think we should be in. I'm glad we're back in. But don't let anyone be an, under any illusion that Paris, as written today, is going to, in fact, solve the climate problem. Wonderful. That's all we have for questions, Admiral Titley. Okay. So thank you very much for speaking to us this evening. All and right. Thank you, everybody who came. And don't forget to click on the link to track your attendance. And <laughs> okay. Dr. Lee, would you like to say anything before we go? No. Well, just thank you very much for having me. I always enjoy doing things with uh, Montana State. I don't know if any of you have uh, taken any of uh, Professor LaChapelle's courses, but I've done a number of things with... Uh, with, with Paul throughout the years. And uh, I always enjoy uh, the different types of collaboration